Good evening, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm with the Midtown Scholar Bookstore in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and we're delighted to be here virtually with you this evening for this evening's program with Eric Johnson and Philip Tetlock. Um, first, just a huge thank you to all of our viewers, attendees, customers, and everyone out there who is supporting indie bookstores. The challenges continue as we ramp up for the holiday season, but we're honored to be able to offer programming like tonight's event. And with that in mind, it's my honor to introduce our speakers here this evening. Uh, our interviewer is Philip E. Tetlock. Philip is the Annenberg University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania and holds appointments in the Psychology and Political Science Departments and the Wharton School. He has published roughly 200 articles in peer refereed journals and edited or written 10 books, including his most recent book with Dan Gardner, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction, a New York Times bestseller and economist best book of 2015. Our featured author this evening is Eric J. Johnson. Eric is the Norman Eig Professor of Business and Director of the Center for Decision Sciences at the Columbia Business School. He has been the President of the Society for Judgment and Decision Making and the Society for Neuroeconomics. His Academy Awards, his academic awards include the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award of the Society for Consumer Psychology, Fellow of the Association of Consumer Research and Honorary Doctorate in Behavioral Economics from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Of course, uh, Eric's new book that we are here for today is titled The Elements of Choice. Here it is, Why the Way We Decide Matters. Um, I've got to read just one blurb. This one's from Robert Kahneman, who writes, quote, indispensable. This book provides an essential guide to the construction of better choices for yourself, for other individuals, and for society, end quote. Some quick housekeeping before we get started. If you have a question for Eric or Philip, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen. It's below our faces here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, so ask away at any point, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. And most importantly, if you would like to purchase a signed copy of The Elements of Choice, here it is once again, uh, please visit our website at midtownscholar.com or simply look in the chat room to the right for a link. Um, that is the number one way to support the author, the bookstore, and this event series. Again, we do have signed copies available, so look in the chat room in just a moment, and thanks for supporting your indies. Uh, but now, without further ado, Eric Johnson and Philip Tetlock. Phil, I didn't know that I had an Academy Award. Somebody should have told me. Eric, you're still there? Yeah, I am. Okay, well, should I? <laughs> Um, I, I'm assuming our audience is still there too. Yes, they are. <laughs> Alex made a rather abrupt, abrupt departure. <laughs> it's okay. All right. So um, I, I think it's a wonderful book, The Elements of Choice. It's, it's, it's deep, it's thought provoking. And um, why, why don't we just start by, by asking you to describe in your own words what it's about? So there's been a long time, and you know this as well as most people, that people have run lots of studies to show that people are inconsistent in decision-making given one way of describing the choice or the other. And, you know, a few years ago, a number of people had the idea that, gee, this suggests that you can ask people a choice in a way that will be likely to get them to make the best choice they could. So that's become called choice architecture. Let me give you a more concrete example. You sit in a restaurant, you see a menu, and you think you're gonna make a choice from that menu. But long before you got there, somebody else has been there and they've been a hidden partner in influence your choice. So they've made a set of decisions. Those decisions include how many options do I present you? What options are on the menu? What are off the menu? How are they organized? Is it vegetarian meat or maybe it's you know from the land and from the sea? Um, what order do things appear? And what information is on the menu? Like do we put calories there or do we put descriptions of its you know where it's from? All these things will influence our choice. And that's what choice architecture it is. It's the decisions that someone who you call a choice architect, I call them a designer makes, that actually will influence your choice and make it either easier or harder for you to make a choice. The very first sentence of your the very first sentence of your book um, is intriguing. Uh, you're right, it's an illusion, really, that we alone determine what we choose. Um, now, there, uh, 
it, it, does that mean you think free will is an illusion? How, how, how strong a position are you taking here? So it's actually interesting because I, I finally got to read a lot of that literature, at least some of it, and, and talk about it in the last chapter. But I think it's clear, let me give you a trivial example. If someone is giving you a menu and they've decided not to put something on that menu, you won't choose it. So that's a trivial example of how the choice architect is going to influence things. Less trivial, and what we mostly don't realize, is things like the order of options will have an influence on your, on your choice. So yeah, there's an absolutist position. You could say, we alone, and that's what I'm arguing against. Obviously, that's why I use the phrase partner, because that choice architect could either be a good partner or a bad partner, but they're having an influence. We've just lost your audio, Phil, you're muted. People don't like to feel as though they're puppets. Um, That's right. Is, 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 that, is, that, is that one source of resistance to um, a choice architecture agenda? So hey, I'm not sure. I, the agenda is a, a, is a problematic word. Here, here's why I think so. It suggests that you cannot have a choice architecture and every choice has an architecture. You have to make, a, as a designer, you have to decide how many options to present somebody. You have to decide an order. You can do it randomly if you want, but there's no such thing as no choice architecture. So let me sort of first say, agenda is, it, it's, it's not, there's no no choice architecture option in, in the world, just like there's no, no architecture in, in the physical world. Something is, the door has to be somewhere. I think that's the very top, fair point. Yeah. Sorry? Um, that's a very fair point. Um, what, what are the, so there are many ways you, act, good actors and bad actors could use principles of choice architecture to achieve their goals. What are the examples, the, the most laudatory examples you can think of, of the use of choice architecture principles? And what are the most deplorable examples that you can think of? Yeah, so there, can choice architecture be used for bad as well as good, absolutely. And as you know, there are people who talk about the opposite of nudging is sludge. And, but choice architecture is different than the common use of nudging. You know, nudging suggests like you could decide not to nudge. And as I'm emphasizing, there is always choice architecture. Favorite example, there would be two quick ones. Um, one is the work that we did uh, now almost 18 years ago, looking at organ donation. And this came about very interestingly because I was actually um, getting a transplant where fortunately, because it was stem cell transplant, I was my own donor. So that was useful, but I became aware that donations vary a lot from country to country in Europe. Uh, for example, in Germany, less than 6% of the people say they're willing to be a donor. In Austria, over 90%. And this was a puzzle. And it turns out the difference is in Germany, you have to opt in to be a, a donor. In Austria, you have to opt out to not be a donor. It's what's become known as defaults. And you know, we, um, Dan Goldstein and I did a fair amount of work looking at this, both in online experiments and looking at actual data. And so it's pretty clear in terms of willingness to be a donor that there's a, a big effect. And this has actually ended up in changes in defaults in several countries. Um, another positive example is everyone may not realize this, but you get to make a choice of who supplies your electricity. That's either going to be a sustainable called green energy, solar, wind, hydro, and even nuclear perhaps, um, or you know, mixed energy, what's sometimes called gray energy, which is coal and other sources. Um, there are some very nice studies where large utilities have randomly assigned people to either having the green energy as the default or the gray energy as the default. And you see differences of 90% in the popularity of green versus gray. And what's interesting is you might say it's because people are lazy or people are being tricked. Well, they've actually done surveys of the people saying, which did you choose and why? And very, almost nobody is surprised by the energy they picked. There's something about the default that changed the way they thought about the problem. It's what I call an assembled preference in the sense that, I don't know, I'd like green energy, I like 
cheap energy. And the way the question is posed actually changes the way we, we evaluate two options. So, yeah, so you, you used a phrase that I think will strike some people as moderately alien um, assembled preferences. Um, most, usually, most of the time, I think of myself as having preferences. And I don't feel like I'm assembling them or constructing them, or I, I feel they exist. Um, and most of the time, I also feel as though I'm making choices uh, on my own. The bullet's volitional, as opposed to I'm being tugged. And, now, I think you make a very compelling case that there are these invisible webs of influence around us. Um, but um, to say that our choices are constructed, how, how strong is the evidence for that? Um, I think, so um, I want to also get back to your other question, which is a, a, a bad application, which I, I will come, to, I want I'm to come right, back right, to right, that. Right, right, yeah, you were in the middle of No, the no, I, I, I'd forgotten that. So, um, but, so, look, I hate liver. I am not going to be framed into eating liver. That's not a constructed preference, not an assembled preference for me. Um, at the same time, to say there, aren't, there are, aren't things that will make me try something I don't know about. Um, so let me just give you one of my favorite examples. Um, in Iowa, they actually were doing studies where they took ground beef and either called it 70% lean or 30% fat and then asked people to taste it after they cooked it and what the price would be. And Irv Levin, who did this research, I've talked to him, he says, basically, not only do you see a difference, people love the lean meat, they're willing to pay more for it. But when you ask them why, they, it's as if they, were, they have lots of knowledge about hamburgers, but they retrieve different parts of that depending upon fat. So with the lean meat, they think about protein, they think about muscle, they think about things like that. With the fat, they think about, you know, sclerosis of the arteries. I mean, they just, the, 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 obviously hamburger has both characteristics, but you retrieve different things with different frames. And so you're aware there's lots of examples of this kind of inconsistency depending upon the frame. Yeah. Um, okay, should we, should we iterate back to the deplorable examples? Sure, um, there are lots of them. Um, you know, there are some that are just illegal. So uh, the FTC is taking people to court by putting defaults in a place where you'd have to scroll down your web browser to see them. So literally nobody sees what they're quote unquote choosing. A much more common example is one that I think we see every day. And so, and that is defaults on cookie choice. That is, if you go to a website these days, you will almost always be asked, can we use cookies? And the default there is yes. And they introduce a couple extra steps before you could get to anything that would actually make, make the site not retain cookies. And cookies for everyone who might not know are little files that are essentially represent permission for the website to track me from site to site to site. And of course, sites make money by selling that information uh, for advertising and other purposes. Now, what they've done is essentially use choice architecture to make it very hard to express an opinion or a preference that I don't, I don't want cookies. In fact, recently one of the sites has been accused of introducing a 1.5 second delay before you get to the page where you can customize things. And one of the things I talk about in the book is the fact that these little short-term effort costs make a big difference because it changes the way you approach the decision. That is, I might want to change, okay, but waiting for 1.5 seconds seems like hell. And so I don't actually change the cookie, I go on and book flight or order from Amazon or whatever it is I'm doing. So it's that kind of thing that, you know, I think is, is, is really a challenge. So I, I, you know, I can imagine there are two different reactions people might have to uh, um, a new book on this topic. One, one, one reaction might be, well, this is psychological research and I've heard that a lot of psychological research doesn't replicate. Um, so uh, how replicable, how robust are these effects? And the other is, oh, oh my God, you, the, 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 these, if, if there are big effects, um, that's dangerous. It gives you a lot of power. You could be manipulating me. Uh, and how transparent should we require people who use principles of choice architecture to be? 
And if they have to be transparent, do the principles of choice architecture still work? Okay, so I folded a lot of questions in there. Yes. Why don't you go at them? <laughs> um, okay, deep breath. Um, so I really cared about replicability. In fact, I, I believe in framing that. So I call it the re reproducibility revolution. And th it's a positive thing. We now have tools. We now know how to evaluate research. And I, when I pitch it to like students, both MBA students and PhD students, look, if phone, someone is doing this, you know that the result is replicable. Writing a pop book or a trade book like this, you have to use stories, but I try really hard to use stories from literatures that I know replicate because people have done careful analysis. The other thing I do, which I think is actually not something that I've seen before in, in trade books, is I actually introduce the concept of meta-analysis and more importantly, the notion of a forest plot. So we don't have a slide, but what we are thinking about here is basically, imagine I take every study that ever looks at defaults and I actually say, what is the size of the other effect? Put them all on the same scale. I can see, do the majority of studies work? Do one or two backfire? And what's the average? It turns out for defaults, we estimate the average change in choice is between 25 and 30%. So that's a pretty, it's not as big as the results I've talked about with 90% or the organization work that shows 40% changes, but there's still a healthy effect. The other thing you see is there is a lot of variability. And so that's something that we need to understand. So that's your first question, I think. Is, is that, can we check that one off or is there? Right, so I, I'm, I'm of the view that the, I don't, I, I actually didn't need to be persuaded that default effects are real and are substantial. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, my, my agenda is more, my agenda is more about the, um, uh, the potential for manipulation and the issue of right. transparency. Right. Oh, just one last thought, which is other things like the number of options. You know, you may have heard of choice overload or the curse of choice. Turns out when you do a meta-analysis there, things are all over the effect. It's, it's actually a much more complex phenomenon than saying too much choice is bad. Sometimes too, more choice is better. And that's a whole nother thing we can talk about perhaps later. Yeah, but that manipulation. Was an example of, of a behavioral effect that got a lot of publicity and Absolutely. didn't prove to be very robust. In fact, it, it, you know, if you squint hard, you can see an average positive, you know, negative effect. But it easily turns out that there are some pretty obvious things like how the choices are structured to make, make the number of options be better or worse. So something I've tried to do is actually think about what some of those things that make more choice better or worse. My favorite example of like bad choice, and, and you might enjoy this, is in New York City, kids choose high schools. And that sounds like, you know, perhaps a good thing. But they are given a book that has 769 different high schools. Now, I, th I and I did a lot of research on finding a, a couple kids who did this. They're overwhelmed. They use very simple strategies that actually usually lead them to bad outcomes. Um, one case, the valedictorian of a high school class, um, he ended up basically saying, I'm only gonna apply to schools that graduate lots of the students. By the way, in New York, I didn't know this, there are high schools that don't graduate, only graduate 40% of the students who enter. So there are a lot of high schools that you don't wanna to go to. So his rules seem to make sense, but it ended up he was applying to essentially the schools that were the equivalent of trying to get into Harvard or worse. You know, they have 1% admission rates. So he ended up not matching any school, which was a bad outcome. And let me contrast that to giving him 30 schools, all within a distance of his home and all he wanted uh, college prep and all of which had a certain cutoff in terms of the number of students who graduated. When people have done that study, people make better choices. They match, they find good schools for them. And so that's an example of how this idea of the number of choices has to be customized to the, to the actual choice that's involved. Now, we still haven't gotten around to manipulation. So should we talk about that? Right. Well, you know, I, I would just say parenthetically that virtually every, I think every case in which Eric Johnson has been involved as a choice architect, it seems that the effects have been in a, a benign or beneficial direction for for human beings. Um, but it, that doesn't have to be the case. Um, not everyone is, good, is going to be as good a human being as you are, Eric. Uh, so um, 
yes, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and obviously there are players, not just in, in, in commerce, but in government who can make things hard or difficult for people to do some things or find out certain things. Now, there, there's a point to your question, which is interesting, which is that by describing these mechanisms, am I enabling bad actors to, to be more effective? Um, and I think I, I'd argue that a lot of this is known, um, but not widely understood. Um, and, you know, I have to say, to go back to defaults, I certainly seem defaults used by companies in ways that I don't think are in people's best interest. Um, it turns out, by the way, a, a government example, um, <clears throat> back in the Bush administration, the No Child Left Behind Act, required by default schools to give the addresses of all kids, high school kids, to Army and Navy recruiters. Now, that may be good, that may be bad, but it's not a default that I think most parents would have said, oh yeah, please send recruiters to my kids' uh, school. So th there's an interest, it's, there's lots of other examples that are more um, dramatic, but I think that's, that, you know, I, it's clearly a problem. Right, but can you imagine any circumstances in which you, if you were in government and you were advising people who uh, uh, control important government programs and you, 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 you see how cost-effective the program is um, and you believe that if it were to become known that principles of choice architecture were being used, that it would become less effective. Would, it, would, would, would your cost-benefit calculation lead you to say, well, we should make that we should obfuscate that. We should we should make it difficult for people to see it, or are you um, a believer, a, a devout believer in transparency? So there, there's actually been a couple studies um, that actually warn people for about some sorts of choice architecture manipulations, and there've also been studies which actually are even more um, annoying in a way when people have actually, for example, used a default and then asked people, "Were you influenced by the default?" So this sort of brings together two of your questions. One is manipulation, and second is awareness. And it turns out in most of the studies, the people who have been affected by the default, we know that because we can see in the study that they've chosen this in with that in the default and this in the other default, they deny that they were influenced by the default. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because we're only in one cell of the experiment. I only see that default. The other thing is when we're making a decision, we are really thinking about the options. We're not thinking about how the options were framed. We're so busy trying to figure out what we want that we're not doing the, what might be the next level, the next ply, which is thinking about how did they decide to sort these things this way? I mean, we could eventually learn with enough experience and repeated decisions perhaps, but it's very hard. Right. And the other thing about transparency is warnings. There's some nice work done where, you know, you basically warn people you're about to be nudge that's literally the title of one of the paper and it has no effect that to me was a surprising effect that warning people because i think the warnings just say you're going to be affected they don't tell you how you're going to be affected or how it works right but, but sure it would probably hinge a lot on the exact wording that you have right if, if i were to say well we're about to manipulate you <laughs> you'd be more likely to get some negative reactants right I, th I think you certainly would, but the question is, will they understand how you're manipulating? You might, they might come up with the wrong theory of what the manipulation is. Sure, yeah. Um, is this relevant to choice engines, by the way? Yeah, so choice engines is a term um, your colleague at Penn, Tom Baker, has used, so has uh, Richard Thaler. Essentially, we've been talking so far about if everything was on paper. And of course, these days it's not. And often you can use multiple tools of choice architecture. So let me just give you one other tool since we've been talking too, too much perhaps about defaults. The order in which things appear turns out to have a pretty big influence. Um, and that turns out to be a very interesting story. Um, and my, the, there are lots of examples, but my favorite example of that is there was a primary election for a Supreme Court judge in Texas. The two candidates were named Rick Green and Paul Green. And it turns out Texas actually randomizes who's first in the ballot across various counties. And it's sort of a perfect storm. 
candidates are confusable, um, an office that may not be the most important. And it turns out whoever was first on the ballot got 20% more votes. So that's an order effect. Now let's take an order effect and combine it with a default effect and put it online. That's what a choice engine is. Netflix is a choice engine. Amazon is a choice engine. The Obamacare websites are choice engines because you can customize them. You can actually control what they do. You can say, let me see only the options that are best on uh, deductible. <laughs> and in theory, they can actually comp increase your comprehension. They, there can be little balloon help saying, this is what a deductible is, or this is what what the reviews are. So they're, they're choice architecture, but the choice architecture is sort of on steroids. So, um, so some so to you to, to push the metaphor just for a second about choice choice engines. There's some choice engines may be more like Ferraris. Um, so, what, what what's the most Ferrari-ish choice engine you've seen? Well, if we're not thinking it's entirely in somebody's best interest, I, I think Netflix is is a pretty interesting example um, because they customize that page for practically every single viewer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you, when you go and it says, you know, it's Phil watching or is Barb watching, you know, it's actually building a model of, of both people and it's using what you watch. And so every column on that display is in fact customized to you. What is in the columns is customized to you. They even do extensive A-B testing for the pictures for each of the little movies to actually, you know, get you to choose one or the other. Now, the thing I, that's true is that often it's not necessarily the thing you would like the most because there's a, a constraint. And that constraint is they want you to actually like things that aren't terribly expensive for them to rent or to produce. Mm -hmm. What's the opposite of a Ferrari choice engine? I th I've seen some really bad government sites. Uh, the, one of the, my favorite bad government sites is the Social Security site where you would actually sign up for be collecting benefits. There's a place where there could be a lot of education, but instead you see a lot of bureaucraties and early versions of the site when I did, uh, they would say, do not hit the back button. I mean, that's pretty dis that's pretty disturbing if you're trying to figure out social security and at the same time you have to worry about the back button uh, and other things. Okay. Um, I wonder what happened to Alex. Yeah, I think it's about time for Alex to join us and we'll take some questions. <laughs> He did. Hey. hey, sorry, sorry to pop the. No, I'm, I'm back. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Phil. Uh, this is a great conversation. To our audience members, uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button below our faces here. I've got a bunch of questions lined up already. Um, and a reminder, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the Elements of Choice, look in the chat room or simply head to midtownscholar.com. Um, OK, we'll just we'll just go ahead and, and dive into it here. Um, so this first one is from Timothy. Um, Timothy asks, who have been uh, your main influences in your career? Any specific books or thinkers along the way? You know, I've been incredibly lucky to work with some amazing people. Um, you know, I, I, you know um, coming from a working class family in, in New, New Jersey, as we would say, you know, the fact I would, I, I, I was just very lucky. So, um, yeah, obviously an early influence on, on me as a person not many people know about, um, Herbert Simon, who was the first psychologist to win a Nobel Prize. I also was lucky enough to um, spend some time at Stanford with uh, Amos Tversky, who was, for many of your, your viewers might know as the other half of Kahneman Tversky and clearly inspirational and actually transmitted, I think, a lot of values. And, you know, in terms of, obviously, I think, you know, I don't always agree with everything I say, but obviously um, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein have, have actually driven some of this area. Um, and so that would be one quick an answer. Phil, how would you answer that? Just curious. Um, oh, I'm not the author, I <laughs> Yeah, but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think we, uh, that we, we want to go down that path right now. Um, but, but, but I like you. I mean, I've, I've had the good fortune of working with a lot of wonderful people. Uh, well, Frederick has a couple questions here that I'll see if I can combine. Um, 
Frederick asks, knowing everything you just said, how do we make better decisions and choices? How do you apply this to critical thinking? And then uh, Frederick also asks, how do you make an important choice if you have too many options in front of you? That's, th th those are Thank really good questions. <laughs> and one thing is, notice what we're saying, what sort of the book is saying, it's not only the person, but also the environment. So if you can find an environment that's better for you, so an environment that, let's take a concrete example, you're going car shopping. There are car sites that give you every possible car site in the world, every possible car model in the world. There are also car sites that actually ask you two or three questions about what the kind of shopper you are and then reduce the set. So you can pick websites, choice environments, where actually they do some of the work for you. So you know, to, to go to the example, the worst site in the world would have maybe the cars listed alphabetically. A better site would say, do you want a family car? Do you want an SUV? And actually maybe even help you comprehend what the difference is if you don't know what the advantages and disadvantages are of both. So a simple answer to the question is basically actually finding the, the choice architecture that will actually help you make better decisions. Um. This next question comes from Adam. Adam asks, what did your research like look, uh, look for this book? Um, studies, surveys, statistics, et cetera. I missed one word, Alex, sorry. Uh, what did your research lo look like for this book? Studies, surveys, oh. statistics, So I talk about um, my own research a little bit, although um, actually, and also other academic research, I also spent a lot of time researching interesting examples and stories. So for example, um, I talked a little bit about the New York City school system and their choice. I actually did some interviews with Al Roth, who is a Nobel Prize laureate who designed it um, and how he thought people would make choices. I also did a lot of research looking at people who had had like um, the people I talk about in the book who had a very hard time and who actually had bad outcomes. Um, it turns out that you know it, it's fascinating to actually see concrete outcomes of a decision of a choice architecture that's not particularly good, and also you know studies where people have tried improvement. So it's some combination. The fun part to me was very much actually finding these examples and stories. It's not the kind of research that you know academics typically get to do. Um, Aaron asked an interesting question. Aaron asks. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the more subconscious hidden factors behind decision-making? Um, this kind of goes back to Philip's question about free will. How much of our decisions are in our control? Well, it's, it's a great question. And I think the, the, you have to make one important distinction here, which is this notion that there, there's confusion sometimes between awareness. I think a lot of the influences that I talk about occur without awareness. So I don't know defaults are going to change my behavior. That's very different than talking about some sort of unconscious you know, processes that are going on in my head that are influencing me. I mean, clearly automatic processing happens. I don't have access to that. But I think the way I spin that question is to think about how aware am I of, of these influences? Hmm. Um, let's see here. Uh... Nathan asked, what was, was there a surprising fact you learned during your research that maybe didn't fit your original narrative? Um, I'm sure there are. I, I, I was going to stop at the surprising fact. It turns out that I found out that in the Eurovision Song Contest, being last is incredibly important. And I never would have guessed that. And it, it was a surprise. It, it actually became a, a big part of the discussion of order. It turns out that when you're given a list and you have control, like you're reading it from top to bottom, being first is often better. But when the, you don't have control, so when you're watching your Eurovision or in a restaurant with people reading you the menu as opposed to handing you the menu, you're trying desperately to remember what has just happened and you're being constantly bombarded by the next act, the next act, the next act. And it turns out there's a lot of actually research that shows that in those circumstances, being last is better. So that was a surprise. And really did change sort of the way I approached that chapter. Because the key is memory has an important role in choice. And when you can't remember, what you can't remember, you can't choose. It's interesting when you, when you mentioned about order sequence, I know as, as a bookstore, sometimes our, our purchase link gets put on various websites for maybe an author or a festival or something. And it's always, we always think about 
well, of course we want to be first. And sometimes people decide alphabetically, but um, that just, this just alludes to what you're saying there about you always want to be first, right? Right. Certainly if it's a, if, if I'm controlling it, if I as the decision making it, controlling it and there's a clear reading order with text, you want to be first. Mm-hmm. Now start, you know, start reading me the list. Then the answer might change. <laughs> Uh, we have a, but, a by question. the way, in in hotel in like Expedia, that can be worth twenty dollars to the hotel that's worth that's first. Mm-hmm. Twenty dollars in additional um, nightly charges is about one estimate of what the value is of being first as opposed to fifth. Interesting. Um, Anonymous has a, has a good question here. They say, would you say that commercials and marketing are the most common users of choice architecture? So I, I think actually the one thing we, Phil and I haven't talked about is that we're all choice architects. That we always pose choices to other people. When I you know, ask my wife, what do you wanna to watch tonight? I'm making the same kind of decisions we've just been talking about. I have to decide how many options to give her, what order to give them in, what attributes do I describe? So in everyday life, um, you know, we're choice architects. So I, I'm not sure, it depends how you mean the biggest users. I think there are more of us than there are firms. So I think actually we may be the biggest user. A uh, quick story. Um, a friend of actually both of ours um, once t- told me they were having a really hard time getting their three-year-old daughter uh, to go to bed because they'd always ask, do you want to go to bed? And you know, another half hour, one more story, something like that. He then changed the choice to be, do you want to fly into bed or do you want to bounce into bed? And the daughter would go to bed without a, a, without a whimper. So that's an example of day-to-day life, maybe even useful for somebody, mm-hmm. but certainly many people have experienced that. You're a choice architect there. Fascinating. Um, another question here. I don't know if this is a good question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Have either of you seen Squid Game on Netflix? This is from Anonymous. They say a lot of what you said about choice making and choice architecture is brought to life in that series. I personally have not seen the show, so I don't know. Can either of you speak, speak to that? Well, I'll go first and say no. I'd be surprised if Phil has. No, I haven't seen it either. Okay. I, 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 I've, I've, certainly, Sorry. it's a thing. It's a big yeah, thing. Yeah, I've, I've heard people talk about it. But, right. uh, I guess I know that. Right? Yeah, neither, neither of us are, can, can offer it. Let's put it this way. The page that Netflix builds for <clears throat> Phil or myself, Squid Game is not the number one option. Well, I've seen it. It's come up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It feels a lot, a, lot, a lot more fun than I am, I think. Um, okay, let's see. I've got another question here. Um, uh, this we you kind of uh, answered this question a little bit, but uh, this one's from Cecily. Who said, "If you have if you had to offer one piece of advice for someone to improve their decision making in day to day life, uh, what would it be?" The only thing I would add to sort of find the right choice architecture for you and and what you that fits is actually you know being more aware of the choice architecture. Now, I've said warning and transparency doesn't work, but I would hope that if you, for example, we know defaults work but because A, people are lazy, ease. Second is I think it's because the person posing the choice, you know, the, the person who designed the form thinks it's best for me. We call that endorsement. There's also something, something else we won't have a lot of time to talk about called endowment, which is I feel as if I own the thing already. And if you understand that, you might not be able to understand how default effects work. And then being aware of how default effects work, try something else. Start with, for example, another option. It's not pre-checked and feel how, see how that feels. Sort of do a sensitivity analysis. Um, I don't have a lot more to say than that, um, but I do think understanding something about process has been sort of the story of my career will help people. Uh, we've got just a, uh, just a couple more questions here. Uh, this one is from Barry. Barry says, how did your personal decision-making change or not uh, during the writing of this book? I certainly became much more aware of, of, of what is being done, particularly with websites. Uh, my wife often complains when I go and order something, it takes me twice as long as it used to. Hmm because I'm actually saying, oh, why did they order it that way? Well, what, what's going on here? So um, I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing. It certainly has made me much more aware of, of the factors that influence my choice. 
yeah, and just as we're talking here, I'm like, I, I need to be more conscious of Netflix, HBO, all these, all these various platforms and how they, how they order things. Um, Daniel quickly asked uh, uh, to kind of uh, go on top of the decision awareness. What are things you can do to increase your decision awareness? You mean other than buy the book? Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, I think a big thing is, is just asking yourself the question, why is the site designed the way it is? Now, this gets a little bit, I mean, there, there is an, a notion that we tend to take decisions framed to us the way they're presented. I mean, this is not just about websites or spouses telling us how to get the movie. It's also often how people describe public policy. And it, it's important to figure out what is the thing that's not being said. It kind of gets I'm, it's tangentially, but to Phil's work on forecasting, it's the stuff that you're not thinking about immediately that often turns out to be very important. And I think that's true in design, set design. And Phil, I think you would probably agree that would be true in, in forecasting too. It's, it's the, the thing that's not apparent that might be important. Yeah, I, the, 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 best, the, be, the best forecasters in our studies are definitely the people who um, are, are good perspective takers and they try to figure out why, 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 why problems are being presented to, to them in the way they are. And they don't they don't take things for granted. They're 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 more likely to try to dig under the surface. Um, so I, I think they're they're they are they are quite sensitive to this issue of um, um, being manipulated. And I will say, Phil has data. I'm speculating. Um, another question from anonymous here. It says, uh, "In what cases should choice architects let subjects know how the subjects are being influenced or even manipulated?" There's a school of thought that says basically disclosure is not only ineffective, which is sort of what most of the literature says now, although there's a lot of work that needs to be done. All that work's done with defaults. And I keep saying, but not talking much about, there's lots of other choice architecture tools like order and, and many other things. Um, but there's a school that says it's even harmful because it's, it, people make the inference, that, oh, you've told me how nice of you, and I'm unable to correct it. So now I trust you because you've told me and I still fall for the, for the trick. This is actually, has been done most, argument has been made mostly in disclosures like doctors saying, oh, by the way, I own, I, I'm sitting for an fMRI, and by the way, I own the, the fMRI place. And that tends to actually be not very productive. At least that's the argument that some people make. I, I don't know what your take is on Phil, but at least that's the argument. So I'm not sure disclosure alone in for choice architecture works and there are certainly people think disclosure doesn't work more generally um okay we'll have uh one last question here it's a good question to end on uh this one's from sharon sharon writes uh what is the main takeaway you'd like people to come away with after reading your book i think Obviously, I've said this three times, but choice architecture matters. But I think the other big takeaway is that we are all choice architects. So many people on, on, on tonight are post choices, not just to family members, but to employers, to employees. We design websites. We um, design courses. Those are all choice architecture. So I think it's not just being aware of what's being done. The real point of the book is to help you be a better designer to actually be able to do choice architecture because of course it's there we're just not aware of it and that actually can have bad outcomes um okay we've got to wrap up but uh eric phil thank you both so much for this really uh really wonderful conversation again the book is the elements of choice here it is um thank you to our audience members we had some great questions um tonight thanks everyone for tuning in and I'd just like to, to pass it back to Eric and Phil, if you have any last words uh, to our audience members. I just want to say thank you for taking the time. And um, hopefully this has been helpful. And I also want to thank Phil, from, you know, who's somebody who, who's both a great scholar and somebody who's, who's written really, really interesting uh, books, particularly super forecasting. Um, and I, you know, someone I try and emulate. Thank, thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a pleasure being here. And my, own, my only regret is I didn't get to ask Eric a question about whether he's a libertarian paternalist, but maybe, maybe for another occasion.
<laughs> uh, we'll go out for drinks sometime and talk about that, Phil. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.